et cetera, and I'm sure it, but they don't speak up. And, uh, and, and so there really is nobody on campus among faculty providing that diversity of opinion for students. So they just don't hear it. Um, reflective of that lack of faculty diversity, I end up being the faculty advisor to most uh, of the non-liberal student groups because there's nobody else for them to turn to. So I'm the faculty advisor for the Cornell Republicans, for Cornellians for Life, for the Cornell Review, for the Cornell chapter of the Network of Enlightened Women. And in the past, depending what student groups have been around, I've been the faculty advisor for uh, Young America's Foundation, various other ones. They don't always, uh, unlike the Cornell Republicans, that sometimes these groups form and then they disappear after a year or two. Um, and so there is nobody else. And I think this has a, a very negative impact on the campus. Part of it is what I said is they, they're just, a lot of the students are just not aware that in this election where if the polls are accurate, and maybe we'll talk about that later, um, Joe Biden's gonna win. But still, there are gonna probably be 60 million or more people in this country who vote for Donald Trump. And I think students don't really understand that because they don't hear that. Um, but it has other negative impacts. One, it leads to a fairly intolerant campus political environment. I mean, the, the president of the university will say the right things about protecting free exchange of ideas and speech and things like that. Um, but the reality for non-liberals on campus is that something that's now called cancel culture has existed for many years. I mean, Rick Santorum came several years ago and was heckled. Um, conservative speakers have been literally driven underground. There's somebody who came to campus, my memory's a little fading, I'd say three years ago, maybe four years ago, Michael Johns Sr. He was one of the original Tea Party movement founders. Uh, I forget what group he founded. And his son at the time was a student undergrad at Cornell. And he was invited to speak, not by the Cornell Republicans, but by the Cornell Political Forum, which is a nonpartisan group, which invites people to campus and they then debate students on various topics. And he was in, Michael John Sr. was invited to campus to debate students on something related to Donald Trump. Well, the Cornell, Cornell police got wind that uh, various student groups were planning to disrupt the event. And so they went to the Cornell Political Forum and they said, you have a choice to make. You can keep your event open to the student body, open to the public, uh, but you've got to pay us $2,500 to provide security, or you have to turn your event private and find an undisclosed location, not the advertised one at which to have it. The um, Cornell Political Forum said, well, we don't have $2,500. And they said, well, then you can't hold your event public. And they did turn it private. They did find a, an undisclosed location for it, which did not remain undisclosed very long because various student activist groups found out about it and were pounding on the doors and screaming and it's all on video and it's been written about. Um, there are other speakers who are essentially chased off campus. And it creates a very toxic environment where people do have other views on campus, but they're now afraid to express them. And by the way, that was under a Cornell policy uh, for controversial speakers. They have since revised the policy, although it's a, it's a little unclear. Everybody's confused as to what the current policy is, but that was the policy for many years. And well, who is going to be controversial on camp Cornell's campus? It's somebody right of center or even somebody in the center. There are literally communist groups that hold conferences at Cornell. And I'm not saying they shouldn't. They don't get disrupted. Nobody threatens to disrupt them. They don't have to pay the security fee because on Cornell's campus, they're not considered controversial. 
Um, and so what it has done is it cre has created a, a bubble atmosphere where you have faculty who are almost uniform in their opinions, very few of whom are willing to speak up. So students have no one to help guide them. They have no one to provide them with the cover that is needed uh, on campus, uh, with the inspiration that's needed on campus. They have uh, policies on campus and student activist groups where uh, it creates an atmosphere where people don't really speak up and are afraid to, and therefore you only hear one thing on campus. Uh, there was a survey that came out two weeks ago, something like that, uh, by three groups, one of whom was the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and two other similar groups. And the FIRE really is a nonpartisan group. I mean, I know them very well. And you know, they are for free speech and free expression and academic freedom, regardless of what your politics are. And so they did a survey with these three, two other groups, and it was professionally done. It wasn't, you know, just sending out mailers and see who responds. They hired professionals to do it. And they surveyed 55 schools. I'm not sure how they chose the 55. Whatever they determined, I don't know if it was US News or whatever it was, as 55 top schools around the country uh, for freedom of speech. And Cornell came in 40th out of 55. And this is a student survey. So this is how students self-rank themselves as opposed to an outsider ranking the schools. And what it found is that their Cornell ranked extremely low uh, in these ratings and where the students judged how free they felt to express their opinions. While this wasn't ranked, they did score it. It was extraordinarily low relative to other schools. And two thirds of the students at Cornell said they do not feel free to express themselves on campus, their political views on campus. And so what you have, and that's what I you know, called the liberal bubble, is Cornell campus is not prepared, the students are not prepared because they've never been challenged to deal with a Donald Trump being elected. And therefore they have cry-ins. Uh, I just wanted to read you, I, I wasn't gonna do any slides or anything, but, but this was from the Cornell Sun the day after the 2016 election. Over 50 Cornellians gathered on Hope Plaza this afternoon for a cry-in to mourn in the aftermath of Donald Trump's shocking presidential victory. Braving the cold wind and occasional rain, Cornellians sat in a circle to share stories and console each other. Organizers encouraging attendees to, attendees to gather closer um, Willard Strait Hall Resource Center employees gave out blankets, tissues, and hot chocolate to keep participants warm, while students signed posters with words of encouragement, including, quote, Donald Trump is not my president, close quote. And so that's, you know, what I wanted to talk about and open up for discussion, which is how do we, one, get to this situation, and two, how do we change the situation? Because one thing I've said, and I've been quoted in the Cornell Sun about this, is this is a disservice, not just to the campus community. It's not just to the right of center students, I won't even say conservative, the, the center and right of center students who don't feel free to speak up on campus. I think it's also a disservice to the liberal students. Because in my experience, the conservative students at Cornell are, first of all, they're not all, but many of them that I've encountered over 12 years are really sharp. And they're sharp because their arguments are honed every single day on campus. To be a conservative, to be, whether it's a John McCain supporter, a Mitt Romney supporter, a Donald Trump supporter, whatever it happens to be, as a student on campus, you are confronted and you are challenged every single day. Whereas if you are a liberal student on campus, you're ne almost never challenged because everyone around you who's willing to speak up, except for this handful of conservatives, agrees with you. And therefore, when you reach 
you get somebody who doesn't agree with you and isn't going to back down, you get disruptions of speech. So rather than debating people, rather than challenging them with questions in the question and answer section, you try to shut down their speech and you uh, disrupt speeches and you bang on the doors. And I think a lot of these problems that we are experiencing at Cornell and elsewhere, the, the term cancel culture has been in the news the last few months, is a result of a campus bubble in which students don't get exposed to other opinions, are taught that other opinions are illegitimate uh, and dangerous and potentially words are violence. And uh, therefore, when a Donald Trump comes along, you are ill-equipped to deal with the arguments on the merits. You're ill-equipped to convince people uh, and therefore you resort to you know, either violence or disruptions or aggressive behavior. And so that, those are my observations, 12 years on campus. And you know, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. So let me uh, remind people, if you're not asking a question, just keep on mute. I think it clears the, uh, it makes things easier to hear. Uh, let me start by just asking the following question to start things. And that is, this isn't something that's new in the last four years. Uh, I believe this has been going on and certainly been a trend for long before that. Um, yeah. That's question one or that comment one really. And I, if you could talk a little bit yeah, about yeah. when there Let's was take... a, a, a curve. And then the, the sort of the follow up is your survey, you know, are, who are the, which are the, the, the campuses that are one or two or three on the free speech in that survey and what are they doing? Uh, are they doing anything or is it just the kinds of students they're attracting and faculty? Yeah, um, so uh, in terms of the curve, this is not new. I mean, the Cornell Sun study was in 2015. Um, somebody's got their uh, microphone open because I'm getting a lot of feedback. I think it's Steven. Yep, great, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, you know if you can precisely chart how we got to this point. Uh, again, I've been on campus since 2000, uh, in seven, late 2007, and uh, things are worse now. Very interesting that the way it started was with disruptions and shout downs of pro-Israel events on campus. Um, and then it kind of turned towards conservative events. So. Um, I can't remember the exact years, but I've covered all this at my website. I mean, there were uh, a lot of disruptions of Israel's Israeli speakers, people who would be deemed pro-Israel um, by various student activist groups. Uh, before, in my 12 years here, there were similar disruptions of conservative speakers. Um, I don't know there's cause and effect, but that's my observation. The uh, the disruptions, I think, are a little less now. Well, obviously this year there are none because nobody's on campus. But I'd say three to four years ago, the disruptions kind of reached a peak. I think the Michael Johns incident really shocked the administration into action because it was so outrageous and it got a lot of press coverage and the school doesn't like negative press coverage. So I can't really say when the curve started to head up, uh, but, I, but it's there. I mean, we are where we are with it. And uh, I forgot the second question. <laughs> uh, well, it was which campuses. Oh yeah, consider? so uh, that, I, I don't have the survey in front of me, but I do remember that U Chicago was number one. Uh, and U Chicago remember. is very well known for their Chicago principles with regard to free speech on campus. So I do think, and I forget what was two and three and four, yeah. it's available, the FIRE uh, campus survey, maybe somebody can pull it up while I'm talking. Uh, uh, and so, and I, so I do think the statement of those principles, which I don't believe Cornell has adopted, would be important. 
like I said, the president says the right things about free expression on campus, but I don't think they actually always do the right things with regard to free speech on campus. Uh, so those uh, security fees for controversial speakers created a mechanism where students could implement the heckler's veto. So the Cornell Republicans have told me that when they have a major speaker come to campus, they have to pay $5,000 in security fees um, for a Newt Gingrich or a Rick Santorum. And so that, again, the policy now is very, un everybody's confused as to what the policy is. But Cornell policy, I think, contributed to that atmosphere because students learned very quickly. If you want to prevent an event from taking place, just go on social media and say you're going to disrupt it uh, and they're going to get hit with huge security fees. I think also the administration has uh, set a very bad example um, in that they um, recently, uh, there was a professor, a chemistry professor, who um, had some tweets supportive of the police <coughs> during protests in June uh, in Buffalo, New York. And we got the kind of now routine, you know, 5,000 signature change.org petition that he should be fired. We, but it was a very organized effort. Um, there were robo emails where you could go to a website and fill in your name and it would automatically send an email to the administration demanding this person be fired um, and a whole lot of other things. And so the administration had an opportunity to soundly uh, defend this person. And, and that statement should have simply been that that was in, within this professor's academic freedom uh, and they were off campus statements and we're not gonna do anything. Instead, they said that, but they then proceeded to denounce him, uh, denounce what he had said and take a political position. And when a university does that, it sets a tone for the university. Um, I mean, I've had similar experiences. I don't want to really dwell on that, but I've had similar experiences at the law school. And so I think when, when the university says, and it was a, a, a statement signed, not just by the president of the university, by the provost, by the chief of police, and two other very senior people, I think the chief diversity officer, um, a scathing statement denouncing this professor while at the same time saying, oh, but it's within his academic freedom, so we can't fire him. Well, what does that say to all the people who don't have tenure? This is a tenured professor. What does that say to the people who don't have the protection of academic freedom? Be they junior faculty? Well, fa junior faculty wouldn't have tenure protection, but they'd have academic freedom. But what does it say to students? What does it say to staff? And what tone does it set at the university where the university essentially says, well, we might have fired him, but we can't because he's got <laughs> tenure. Um, and then denounces him. So I think the administration, while they say nice platitudes about free speech, they were unwilling to take the heat from the public. They were unwilling to stand up to the flood of robo emails and the 5,000 signature change.org petition uh, and simply tell people, you know, that's it. So I, I think that is part of the problem. While the administration says the right things, I don't think they really do the right things. Okay, thanks. Professor? Go ahead. Stephen. Who, who's next? Stephen. Go oh, ahead, Steve. Have you ever lived in Manhattan? <laughs> I mean, my reaction is you just described Manhattan. That's what it is. And I think it's going to get worse on the college campuses because my view is that the Board of Trustees are people who respond only to outside pressure, namely media, and the New York Times, which is the media they read, is getting worse and worse from your point of view, and therefore less and less pressure would be put. I, I would be surprised if in three or four years that the New York Times would even run a story about the libertarian speaker because it wouldn't fit the narrative, and so there wouldn't be any pressure on Cornell. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, could I, I add something I, quickly? Um, two things. One is I have a class, a high school classmate who lives in Cambridge, and I was talking to him after the election, and said some things about 
Trump's opponent and my reasons for not being too interested in voting for that person. And he said, and, but, but what I really said was, our democracy is stronger than Donald Trump. And nobody, nobody on the Democratic side seems to think that. But anyway, um, the other thing is, I think we had cancel culture not long after I graduated at, a, at a, a, an Oliphant event. Didn't we invite the premier of, of Vietnam to speak and he got shouted down? Or, or I, the, was, I was involved. Yes, um, uh, Steve. Correct. New in Cao Key, there were similar, um, similar demonstrations. I mean, Cornell has had a, a long history um, of sit-ins and et cetera over the decades since I've been uh, familiar with Cornell, since right. the 70s, late 60s and 70s. I, I guess my question is, how do you balance activism with um, uh, with, with this um, this cancel culture? I mean, uh, uh, where's the balance? Well, they, didn't, they didn't charge us $50,000 for a security fee, nor did they do it the next time we had William F. Buckley on campus. <laughs> so what they've done now, is very much like what happened in Charlottesville, where the mayor and the police just stood aside and let the Antifa attack the bad guys, or what they did with the police, pro-police demonstration in Denver, Colorado, where the mayor told the police to stand back. But Cornell done exactly what you said, Professor. What Cornell has now done is basically say that the uh, effectively, unless you're rich, that the police won't protect you. They'll only you'll only be protected if you have the Proper view. Uh, the uh, somebody had asked before what were the top ranked colleges. I just pulled them up. So University of Chicago was number one, Kansas State was number two, Texas A and M three, UCLA four, and Arizona State five. These are top ranked. I'm sorry. These are top ranked for free for, speech. That for free speech. Okay. Yep. So they have the, best practices that. Yeah, and, and it also, I think, is related to student, how students responded on their surveys. Are these colleges that are really good, or are they just like, they're horrible, but at least they're better than ones that are worse? Uni well, I mean, U Chicago <laughs> isn't, Chicago. U Chicago isn't too shabby. No, not at all. <laughs> okay. uh, the well, worst. Not, it's a phenomenal the worst. Activity. But I mean, in terms of free speech, is that for real, or is that like, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't go there. You know, I, I, you know, I do remember reading that the University of Chicago professor issued a statement that says, you know, college is about being exposed to ideas that are different than the ones already in your head. If you're not comfortable with that, don't come here. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but um, it was a fairly straightforward statement, which I would hope every college press professor and college uh, president would promote. Um, yeah, but when you've got a university like Cornell, which is so homogenous in terms of political viewpoint among the faculty, uh, students get the message, okay? And a lot of the faculty, I won't say the majority, but a significant minority of the faculty view activism as part of their academic purpose. And that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their minds around, uh, but, uh, they view interacting and leading the students and encouraging the students to be activists on campus as part of their academic mission. They really do. And so it's a very, so, you know, I think it was the president of U Chicago who issued that statement. I don't yeah. think it was just a pro professor. No, it was the, pro it was the president, you know, and so it's got to be backed up. I don't, you know, uh, the bottom colleges, Stephen, if you could, again, mute your sound, because it's sending a lot of feedback my way, thanks. Um, uh, the bottom five were Syracuse University, Dartmouth, Louisiana State, University of Texas, which, <laughs> by the way, somebody emailed me just as I was getting on, just lost a big case in the Fifth Circuit over their free speech codes, over their speech codes. I haven't read it yet but apparently the Fifth Circuit slammed them and found unconstitutional their speech codes on campus. Um, so they were bottom, second to the bottom, and then DePaul, not DePaul, DePaul University was bottom of the 55. Um, so. Uh, is, is, 
the statistic that you started with about 99% of the political donations from professors on college campuses, it's not just Cornell, I think. No, no, that was, that was specific to Cornell. Well, that is a Cornell statistic that is apparently going to be published tonight, and it's completely consistent with um, what I've, what the Cornell Sun has published before. But isn't, isn't nationwide the numbers also very skewed toward liberal donations, even the 70s or 80 percent as well? Uh, I don't know that. I would expect that it would be, but I don't know. I haven't seen that. You know, again, the question I've got is uh, if, if you know, are there conservative faculty that are just not being allowed to teach and be part of universities mm -hmm. or are there? Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, mostly in the humanities and social sciences. Um, the, uh, I did see a study recently, I forget who published it, which found that if you go back 20, 30 years, the split between professors who self-identify as liberal and self-identify as conservative was about 60, 40 liberal to conservative. Um, it is now something like 13 to one. And if you look at the incoming junior faculty, people who've been hired in the last few years, it's 40 to one liberal or left of center to conservative. So what has happened is that there has been a takeover of faculty hiring in the humanities and social sciences. A uh, perfect example, if you want a microcosm of what has happened in larger uh, academia, look to my alma mater, Hamilton College. I don't know if how many of you know, Hamilton College in upstate New York. Uh, so I went there in started there in 1977, and it was Hamilton, all male, Kirkland, all female. Kirkland was founded in the 60s as an alternative sort of school, kind of artsy. Um, it was actually a pretty good mix of the kind of stodgy conservative guys and across the street, the, the liberal girls. Um, and Kirkland basically went out of business. So my sophomore year, Hamilton acquired Kirkland, merged it, went co-ed, and retained the Kirkland faculty. And what happened is over about 20 years, the Kirkland faculty, who were much more activist than the conservative Hamilton faculty, took over key committees and did the hiring. And they only hired people who were like them politically. And so what you had is you had Hamilton become indistinguishable from Oberlin College or Wesleyan or any of those others. And Hamilton now, it, that's the way it is. It was so bad that it, uh, three professors who were either retired or nearing retirement uh, were very upset with the uh, multicultural curriculum, what we would now call critical race theory, that had taken over the campus. And so they obtained funding to start uh, the Alexander Hamilton Institute at Hamilton College for the study of Western civilization. Uh, this is going back 10, 12, 15 years. They, um, obtained 100% funding to build a building on campus, fund the institute. It would not have cost Hamilton College a penny. The president said, great. The administration approved it. The faculty threw an absolute fit and revolted. Uh, and the president and the administration capitulated and refused to allow that institute on campus. Um, so they took that money or some of it and they bought the old Alexander Hamilton Hotel in Clinton at the bottom of the hill, if you're familiar with that. And they now run the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, which is not affiliated with Hamilton College. Um, and they get 100 to 150 students a semester participate, coming down the hill to their facility to participate in their educational programming. It's not for credit. Uh, and so the, what that says to me is one, the faculty essentially took over Hamilton College, expunged um, through attrition, the non left-wing faculty, uh, and then implemented their agenda on campus by refusing to allow a uh, institute deemed non-critical race theory 
to be placed on campus. And so now students have to trek down the hill to get the education they want. Of course, if it was on campus, they probably have double or triple that number just because of the, the nature of having to go off campus. And that is a microcosm is what, of what has happened in academia generally. Um, another anecdote, so I was at Harvard Law School in the early 1980s, graduated in 1984. Um, some infamous and famous <laughs> classmates, Loretta Lynch, I guess would be called famous. Um, Elliot Spitzer would be called infamous. Um, and, uh, but if you look at the, what I would call radical leftist students on campus, um, virtually all of them, or many of them, went into academia, uh, including my classmate, um, of course now I'm forgetting her name, um, ah, I'll remember it as soon as we're done. But the woman who invented the doctrine of intersectionality was one of my classmates, which is now the dominant ideology on campuses, which says there are interlocking systems of oppression. And depending on what your, your um, identity is and other things, you have a different hierarchy of oppression. Um, and uh, very now has morphed into an extremely anti-capitalist uh, uh, movement and is dominant on campus. So, so then another example that they went into academia, the non-radical leftists, we went to law firms, we went to, you know, I'm a, in academia by accident, really. Uh, it wasn't my career. I was a lawyer for 20 plus years. And uh, so, I mean, I think that's another anecdote about how academia has been taken over uh, and it is moving into STEM, okay? You know, five years ago, people would say, oh, at least we've got STEM hasn't been tainted. And I would say, you have no idea what is coming down the road, okay? And now STEM is, uh, critical race theory is now moving quickly into the, the sciences and to the math and sciences uh, to the extent that uh, professors who are looking to be hired or promoted have to have sufficient diversity statements. Nothing wrong with diversity, I'm not against it. But if you're a mathematician, really shouldn't that be what you're judged on? If you're a physicist, uh, do you have to engage in social activism in order to get hired as a physicist at Cornell or some other school? And that's where STEM is going. That's where STEM is going. So it is not, I, I am not optimistic. Um, I think that if there is a, uh, depending what happens in the election, uh, you know, and by the polls, it looks like Biden's gonna win. And again, I'm happy to talk about that. But uh, assuming that happens, then uh, there will be no reform of higher education. Um, if Trump gets reelected, uh, I think that his executive order which may or may not hold up in court, but I think it probably will. Uh, withholding funds uh, from institutions that require critical race theory training for people. Um, we'll have a very powerful um, impact at reforming institutions. Uh, an example would be the Solomon Amendment that was passed 20, 30 years ago. Um, which was upheld by the Supreme Court. So the Solomon Amendment said that federal funding would be withheld from universities that did not allow military recruiting on campus and treat military recruiters as they would any other recruiter. Harvard and Harvard Law School would not allow military JAG recruiters on campus because of the don't ask, don't tell policy. And the, uh, they said that was contrary to Harvard's uh, protection of uh, gay rights, et cetera. Um, and they said, well, we're not gonna allow you to recruit law students because of that. And uh, the government said, that's nice. We're gonna pull your funding, not just from Harvard Law School, but from all of Harvard University. You know, probably, tens of millions of dollars a year, maybe more. And uh, Harvard sued and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Solomon Amendment was upheld as constitutional. Now that was a, an amendment to legislation. It wasn't an executive order. So what Trump's done is 
a little different, I mean, procedurally different, but the concept that the federal government has the power to um, withhold its funding, uh, depending on policies, and can set policy requirements with, it, with constraints uh, for that funding, I think is well established. So uh, I think that would have an enormous impact um, on universities. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Harvard Law School um, then relented and uh, said, okay, well, we can't afford to lose our funding, federal funding, so we will continue uh, you know, to enforce this policy that we think is grossly um, prejudicial to our students. So you found out very quickly what the price of their principles was. It was whatever federal funding they got uh, ended up being more important than their principles. Uh, so I don't, uh, how, do, how do you get back from where we are? We're 40 to one faculty, incoming faculty. Um, I don't know, I think the other thing you'll see, again, I think a lot will depend on the election, are budget cuts at state universities. Uh, entire social science and humanities departments eliminated. Uh, I think there is a very big political backlash building whether it's, you know, 50% plus one to win an election, I don't know, but it's substantial. And I think you will see more governmental uh, control exerted over public universities. So that's where I see it, it going. I think it is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I think the next year to three could be extremely ugly on campuses. Let's open it up to others for questions. Mark? Okay, I, I have one. Uh, Professor, you mentioned a number of times that President Pollack has kind of said the right things, but by the same token, hasn't she been leading the charge that has led to this mandate that every student must take a four credit course in anti-racism, or I don't know how it's defined, that will be taught presumably exclusively by you know, liberals, that this is a form of compulsory indoctrination. And for that matter, all the professors are also going to be required to take some sort of training. I mean, this is indoctrination. This seems to me to go not only contrary to academic freedom in general, but to the whole notion of what Cornell is supposed to be about. So I'd, I'd invite your comments on that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of really bad things rolling down the hill at Cornell. Um, I noticed our, our brother, Bob Harrison, is not on this event. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, <laughs> there's some really bad stuff happening at Cornell. I've written some about it, and I've really been waiting till after the election to go more public with it and get more publicity about it. And this comes from the president's office. Um, and thank you, Mark, for reminding me about this. Um, the president decided that Cornell was going to become a quote unquote anti-racist campus. Now, anti-racist is a term of art. It does not mean not racist. Okay. Um, in fact, it means the opposite. Uh, it means it's the book that is driving this and the book that was recommended reading for students this summer and is the focus of many discussion groups and things like that is a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, and in that world, you are either anti-racist, which means you are actively fighting against the system, or you are racist. There is no such thing as being merely not racist. So what that means as an ideology is that you are either with them or you are against them. And that's I think it was very just, if I could just interrupt quickly, I think it was Eldridge Cleaver, a noted upstanding member of the uh, citizenry who said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem in the 1960s. Right. And, and it's a very similar, uh, similar ideology. And so what the president's mandate has been is that that is going to be pushed down. It's already been pushed down to staff. The, um, your how you perform on these anti-racism benchmarks that they've established. And I don't know what they are because that's not public. That's something they've established for staff. Um, I mean, I know the general parameters because I know the ideology and things like that is now part of their annual performance reviews. So if you want to get your performance, good performance review, you have to demonstrate 
and again, I don't know how they measure it, you have to demonstrate that you have performed well on this anti-racism initiative and they're, which they sometimes, they call, um, uh, they call um, equity and inclusion. Uh, equity doesn't mean equality, okay? Equity means equal results. Um, uh, they, it is working its way through the faculty senate, nothing has been decided um, to require a, as part of the undergraduate curriculum, a mandatory course that would fulfill the anti-racism requirement. Uh, and as Mark correctly notes, we know who's going to teach it. It's not going to be me. It's going to be the radical professors. And so students will be required to take such a course for credit in order to graduate. Um, they are also considering some sort of requirement for faculty, and it's a little vague. The way they've worded it, the way the president has worded it, it's a little unclear uh, whether it is going to require faculty to teach such things or require faculty to take training in such things. It's, it's very unclear. Uh, but this is top down. This is from the president's office. Um, as a little bit of background, <clears throat> the way this all started is obviously, you know, the prior president died unexpectedly from cancer. I believe it was cancer. And Martha Pollack was appointed. And not long after Mar Martha Pollack was appointed, there were a couple of incidents on campus that um, one was a student reportedly screamed outside the Latino house or the Latin house, whatever they call it, um, build the wall. And that was deemed like a hate thing, a hate act. Um, it was reported by a conservative college newspaper, I think it was Campus Reform or somebody else, using a Cornell based correspondent that the person who shouted that was actually a liberal student who was saying it mockingly, meaning to mock Trump, not to mock the students living in this ethnic house. Um, I read that. I spoke to another person who said, yeah, that's what they're hearing. I emailed the university for comment um, because of my website. And I said, this is what I'm hearing. This is what has been reported. Um, can you confirm or deny it? And their response was, we have no comment on it. Um, the second incident involved an um, incident between some white students at an off-campus house and a black student. Um, and um, there was some sort of fight ensued and somebody, the, one of the white students reportedly said the, the N-word during this fight. Um, and of course that's not excusable. And the, um, but the incident was portrayed as basically an assault and battery on a black student during which this word was said. Many months later, it came out that that's not what happened. The police did an investigation. And in fact, it was the black student who assaulted the white students. Um, but uh, those facts were probably known to the administration. But Martha Pollack used those two incidents to launch the beginning stages of what now has become the anti-racism initiative at Cornell. I think there's going to be a lot of publicity about this. In fact, I can guarantee it. Um, and it is really pernicious and it is coming down the road and it is the administration at the highest level determining that students, staff, and faculty are either with them or against them. And being a bystander is not enough because one of the um, edicts in the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, like I said, is if you are not, if you are not actively fighting the system, then you are racist by definition. The other um, aspect of it is it advocates present day racial discrimination in order to rectify prior racial discrimination. And you're seeing that now because there was a statement circulated <clears throat> uh, a month ago, something like that, um, signed by hundreds of people on campus, including nine law school faculty members, um, a set of demands for the university. And among those demands were race-based hiring and promotion. 
something clearly illegal under the anti-discrimination laws. Um, yet there was no denunciation by President Pollack. Uh, they feel free to advocate racial discrimination as a means of remedying prior discrimination, clearly illegal. Um, and that's the atmosphere on campus and that's what's gonna be coming down. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Because it's not clearly illegal, uh, the, unless you're talking about Title VI. Briggs was decided in 1971. Every private business is forced to do affirmative action because of Briggs, which is really an equality of outcome. They've outlawed, in a, in a sense, if they, they're extending Briggs to the college campus. Well, because they receive federal funding and they're, re they're regulated by federal laws, federal anti-discrimination yeah, laws. Briggs decided this was under Title VII, which is a federal law exactly the same as Title VI. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 clearly was aimed to have a race-neutral effect, but the Supreme Court has decided that IQ tests and other kinds of things that were commonly used are not usable. And effectively, that's required affirmative action in the private workforce. Why wouldn't the same thing apply to colleges? And why wouldn't the same thing apply to the college students you accept? If you're accepting less than an appropriate number of Negroes, why wouldn't you be in violation of Briggs? And they could say the SATs were essentially an, a proxy for an IQ test and they were illegal. Yeah, well, that's, those are not, that's not the analysis that I've read about the proposed Cornell policy by these faculty. Um, there's somebody um, at the Competitive uh, Enterprise Institute who's a pretty well-known lawyer, um, Hans Bader, and he wrote about the policy um, proposed in this Cornell demand letter. Uh, and his conclusion, at least, is that it, it clearly would be illegal under federal um, uh, anti-discrimination law, Title VII and, and uh, Section 1981. I don't claim expertise in that, but the analysis I've read about that is that if you, if Cornell were to implement race-based um, hiring and promotion, that that would be unlawful. There are some narrow exceptions to it, uh, but those would not apply to Cornell. So if Cornell had been a segregated university or something like that and needed to remedy it uh, for a limited period of time, that might be a permissible. But that's, you know, I, maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's not the analysis that I've read. Uh, Bill, can we go on for a few more minutes? I know we yeah. spent uh, 8.30. I want to be respectful of your yeah. time. Okay, please. Anyone else? Let me, let me just point it, going back to something that you, you, I don't know if it was John or Jeff said, uh, yeah, in the 1970s, uh, Bill, you may not know this, but uh, Sigma Phi does have a fairly well-funded speaker program. And uh, in the 70s, William Colby came, and uh, former director of the CIA. And while he was not shouted down, there was 2,500 people in Bailey Hall listening to his speech um, with a reasonable amount of, I guess, uh, enthusiasm in the audience, let me put it that way. Um, Nguyen Cao Ki, the ex-general who ruled Vietnam, also That's came it. prior to that. And William, he, Buck William Buckley, William Buckley also came. Yeah. But my point is that he was actually not allowed to speak. It was a full Bailey Hall. And wow. there was discussion, in fact, uh, regarding free speech. The university came down fairly strongly in their statement that people visiting campus must be allowed to speak. And they were in violation of campus policy and code to do that. I guess this is leading to the question, and during my tenure running the program, Phyllis Shafley and Sarah Weddington, who was the lawyer that um, presented Roe v. Wade um, before the Supreme Court, held a debate in Bailey Hall, which was a fascinating evening. My question is this, can we return to a event focused on differing viewpoints on stage at the same time as one potential step toward getting audiences to listen? Well, there is some of that going on, and uh, this is um, the president's office, I think, under pressure or under negative publicity, um, has a, a speaker series. And there have been some where there have been competing viewpoints um, on uh, campus, maybe not as stark as Phyllis Schlafly and the uh, Sarah Weddington, maybe not that stark 
a difference, but differing views. Uh, but to me that, I mean, that's positive. I'm not against it. And I'm, I think they should do more of it. But I think we should not kid ourselves into thinking that that changes dramatically the, you know, the nature of the campus. Because these are people who come and go. Um, the faculty is there almost forever. And it's completely left-leaning or close to completely left-leaning. You know, I mean, I've had many people, uh, I've had people at Cornell, but also people at other colleges and universities who would love to write for my website, but they're scared to death, okay? Because they might come up for review, they might come up for hiring decisions. Um, I had one student, who, one person who was a um, PhD student who did write for my website, but under a pseudonym, because uh, he was scared that if, Somebody looked him up and he was writing on a conservative website. He'd never get a job in academia. And he's probably right. Ex with a few narrow exceptions, he's probably right that he would be screened out before, he, you know, before his resume or background was ever considered. So, you know, I think, uh, I think a speaker series is great. They have it. I think it has very little impact on the day-to-day -day life in the campus. I remember they brought a speaker, and I'm trying to remember who it was. Oh, was it, I think it might have been Brett Stevens or it might have been somebody else. Um, you know, they really brought a speaker who was, you know, left of center, but maybe not necessarily popular with the left. And, uh, I watched the live stream and they had audience shots and who was in the audience? Not a lot of people and at least visibly almost no students. So you had administrators there who were very proud that they did, had invited this person to campus. Um, and, you know, there was a big push to get people to it and hardly anybody on campus showed up for it. It was not a packed auditorium at all. So yes, speakers would be good. It's a step forward. I'm all in favor of it, but it's a drop. I mean, it's, when you're required to take courses where you uh, have an ideology, uh, you know, how many students in whatever, if they do develop this new quote unquote anti-racism course requirement, how many students are gonna dare disagree with it during their class? You know, uh, students are very afraid on grades. I mean, professors have enormous uh, power over students. And, you know, I've heard many times that, you know, students say that they just don't engage with the professors rather than express their viewpoint in classroom. Because so, also scared of other, other students. Other students, yeah, there's enormous, I mean, you know, social media, if you wanna look at the curve of the, or the arc of, how we got to where we are. I think the rise of social media and the ability of people to swarm on social media is a big impact. Now there was social media when I started in 2007 at Cornell, but nothing like there is now. I mean, I don't even think Twitter existed back then. Uh, you know, and so the, I think the rise of social media where students can swarm has been enormously uh, detrimental to, you know, free speech. And when I say free speech, a lot of people like to nitpick. Oh, well, the First Amendment doesn't technically apply on Cornell because it's a private campus. It's a, well, we use free speech in a more general term, which is uh, open dialogue, open discourse, ability um, to express your views without being harassed. Uh, you know, we don't tech mean in the technical sense that it's a constitutional violation. Um, but, you know, and, and I, so I think social media has had an extraordinarily negative impact on the ability to have diverse viewpoints on campus uh, because of the swarm effect. I mean, students are very worried. Students are also very worried and legitimately so about names being attached to them on the internet. Um, and so uh, the uh, 
students don't want to speak up because if, if they get called a racist or a homophobe or whatever it is, and that's out on the internet, they're, they're scared to death because, you know, when they go to apply for a job, every employer now uh, hires an outside service to do a social media search on people and they're going to find it and they're not going to spend the time to decide, was this a frivolous accusation? Was it a malicious accusation? Uh, they don't want to deal with it. Can I, if I can just jump in first, I want to just give a little shout out to Frank Mead. I don't think Frank, I've seen you since I was an active. And I remember back in that day, you were a very supportive and positive force of leadership among the alumni. So just very nice to see you, Frank, and thank you. Um, and to Bill and really to everyone, this is a question that I had submitted to Dan, which was, you know, obviously all of us have loved Cornell and do continue to love Cornell in some ways, but if we were advising a high school age student who was thinking of applying somewhere, could we in good conscience encourage them to apply and go to Cornell? And I have to say, unfortunately, in my case, I could not, unless maybe they were applying to some very specific, limited, perhaps a scientific area, but as, as Professor has pointed out, even those STEM areas have now been invaded by this kind of ideology. But, uh, you know, I think it's really come to that, that I, I, I could not in good faith say, yeah, go to Cornell, you'll have a great experience there. I think it's, it's, it's gotten to that. And I'd be interested to have not only the Professor's reaction, but any of us here. Well, I guess my, my question would be, what tools are there in the toolbox? I mean, you're sw I, this, this conversation is swimming upstream at a very, very difficult time with, with tribalism in this country at a point which probably has not been seen since the McCarthy era. I'm not a historian, but I got to believe that to be the truth. But um, I mean, there are student codes of conduct. There are professor codes of conduct. Um, there are best practices around freedom of speech. And I think to begin to tackle this, you're not going to, you're not going to immediately impact the mix of students at a, at a university the size of Cornell or even at a small university. But you can, you can, be, you can guide the behaviors of those individuals with regard to respect for the individual. And is that, is that a way to start um, start this process. Uh, I'm going to throw. Uh, it yeah, I'd, I'd like to support and, and go a little further there. Um, just the idea of promoting civility. Um, you know, we attorneys have been accused of, of being uncivil and unreasonable, and we've had programs on how to be civil to one another. And and why can't we make that a condition of being a student or or a faculty member is that you at least engage in civil conduct? if you're going to be a part of the Cornell community? I think that it's a war, and I don't think people at war, I'm uh, speaking of the left wing, it's a war, and they're going to use the tools they feel are effective, and these are effective tools at this point. And I think professors, um, I suppose that if you pose by real force, like withdrawing federal funds, that'll have an effect, but I think saying be nice, it's not going to, it hasn't worked in the political environment, and it hasn't worked, uh, but I doubt it would work in the university. But, but when you have student codes of conduct like plagiarism, et cetera, et cetera, and the penalty for, uh, for um, uh, you know, wrongfully uh, um, acting is expulsion, then those who would wrongfully act would be expelled and you may, you may start to see a, a turn. But that's a pretty heavy, uh, that's a pretty heavy weight to have above your head to be thrown out of college. But you're, but you're assuming that the existing faculty and administration will enact such rules. That's the problem. I mean, if I was the president of Cornell and I controlled the board, the answer would be very simple. You have free speech within about 10 minutes because probably half the class would be thrown out the banks for financing and then go to new students uh, and then it would resolve itself but that's not going to happen because the faculty is as described by the professor
Well, how many big donors? I mean, it's all about money, isn't it? Oh, exactly. That, I was just going to say. Oh, so, so how many big donors do we have who could, who could step in and, and say, uh, I'm, and not just like Mark, I'm not going to recommend it, but um, I'm not going to give you the money. That, Look at that, Silicon Valley. The donors are all forcing this. They're not They're not against it. The, the biggest money in this board is all run by Goldman Sachs. I mean, Goldman Sachs and other hedge fund guys, they obviously approve of it or they wouldn't allow this to happen. They, the uh, board of trustees is the one who raises most of the money. So well, you, clearly you, the, the capital is woke capital at this point. And so you have, I mean, if Goldman Sachs wants it to happen, it's happening. Bill, have you been in touch or have you had any conversations with Peter Coors? I know that he is you know, an outspoken member of the Cornell alumni and also obviously um, supportive of conservative causes. And I know his um, father, also an alum, when he was alive, at one point withdrew all support of Cornell based on the takeover of the Strait and the university's response in 1969. Yeah, he sponsors a speaker series. Uh, I don't know if it's for all of Cornell or Cornell Law School, but they they recently had a an event, a panel discussion uh, that was sponsored by him and his wife, uh, and a shout out was specifically given to them. I guess they were watching it. You know, it was virtual, kind of like this, uh, by the dean of the law school, and the, the topic of the panel was. Um, cancel culture on campuses. Um, we don't have enough time, but that's particularly <laughs> humorous to me <laughs> that Cornell Law School would hold such a, a panel discussion um, uh, as if they're against it. And uh, so I know he's active in that way. I've never had any contact with him or communications you know, with him, but you know, he has a speaker series, uh, perfectly legitimate topic. I know they've had other speakers. Uh, I don't think they have one necessarily every year, but I know there have been other ones at the law school and maybe in other schools. Um, you know, I, I think the, the problem is what, what would impact the administration? Federal funding would, uh, and the loss of very major donors, okay? And there is no sign that anything that has happened at Cornell is slowing down. I think they had another record year for alumni giving. Um, they are, as many universities are, they are extremely, extremely uh, experienced and good at creating you know, a culture where people uh, feel they have to give to Cornell regardless every year. Uh, it becomes a culture, culture thing. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know if that would have, but there's also many donors who want, who like, probably like what's going on on campus and are all for it. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I don't know what would motivate them, uh, but it's, of, it's a negative situation. I think a lot of our donors, the biggest ones, or the, the, the in our donor base, strikes me tends to be either investment bankers who are regulated, or hedge fund people who, in turn, get all their money from public pension funds. So they're very responsive and scared about any reaction of public entities. For example, KKR. I'm not saying they're a donor; they aren't. But KKR got a shitload of money from the Oregon pension fund. Well, we know what's going on in Portland. So if you, that's where the real money is in terms of its public pension funds or private pension funds from publicly traded companies. So you, you, you go up the chain and there's not, there's, you know, the idea that you're going to get to somebody like H.L. Hunt who just says, screw you. And even he had to go to bankers. So there's a chain there that very often once the zeitgeist changes, uh, most of the donors are on, feel that they're under the same pressures that university presidents are under. So it's a, it's a, it's a continuing bad cycle. 
Steve Foley, how did you become so cynical? <laughs> uh, well, who was said that, Bo? No, John Evil. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I just spent 40 years advising people on Wall Street. Uh. <laughs> where the money comes from. I'm not saying they're cynical, but they're rational. If you were running a $20 billion hedge fund and you were starting a new $20 billion hedge fund, which they do every year, and you're going out and marketing to the LA Pension Fund, which has $80 billion, or you're marketing to the Calf Pension Fund, which has about $300 billion, and that's where the bulk of your money is going to come from. Are you going to come out against gay rights? You're out of your mind. Are you going to come out against anything that's the zeitgeist at that point? You're going to be very, very concerned about uh, if you're rational. And I suppose that in theory, there could be somebody who's just so independent that they don't care. Probably somebody with inherited wealth that has a private portfolio in the hundreds of billions. But those people are pretty rare. I think we have to get Ezra Cornell and Bob Harrison on our on our next call. Uh, let's go right to the top. <laughs> I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think Bob is going to do anything. Sure. I guess my would be most concerned. Like I said, I, my my biggest concern in the near term is the is the you know the freedom of speech and the respect for different viewpoints in a university atmosphere. I don't I don't know I don't know that you're going to turn back. Um, what what appears to be a movement, um, in, and you're talking to a, a former a former re, former Republican who is now an independent, uh, based on this administration's behaviors. But uh, I'm not sure you're going to turn that back. But I would say that in a university, I, I think the focus should be um, should be on 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 sharing ideas and the uninhibited expression of of well-informed opinions, and when I say well-informed, I mean, I mean not, you know, off the wall, uh, crazy, um, uh, uncivil uh, actions. But uh, anyway, that that's I guess that's where I would land on on this conversation tonight. I would hope so. I just don't think the other side of the left wing wants free speech. Let's. Um... If people have a final question they want to, or comment they want to share. Um, professor, have you examined in any detail the rules on tenure, and the ability of a university, the constraints on the ability of a university to provide tenure to professor? Um, no, I haven't. Anyone else? No, I, I certainly. Uh, this has been very interesting. I certainly appreciate the professor's time on this. I'd like to. I'd like to um, continue this conversation. Frankly, I did read that book. Um, I found it very enlightening. I found it uh, uh, introspective. I think, um, but uh, I certainly understand uh, the other viewpoints around this. But it, this has been very good, and I appreciate it, Dan. Thank you very much. Well, and thanks to Mark for making the introduction. So, well, it's not that's this shouldn't be the end. I think that, um, you know, one of the, I, I don't know if I want to call it a hallmark of Sigma Phi, but we've had this opportunity to welcome people of a variety of viewpoints. And I think through the history of Oliphant, um, less so in recent years with Tannenbaum, but we were heading in that direction, um, seeking out controversy, seeking out differing viewpoints. And I, I think it's, it, it helps. It is an opportunity for the students to spend two or three hours in the living room hearing firsthand, not from their Twitter feed, but from the voices of people who have opinions that might be different than their own. And we should do all we can to encourage that, if not on campus as a whole, certainly within a world that we've got some control over, which is Sigma Phi. A shout out to Dan for organizing this. I know that. Oh, my pleasure, guys. You're very broad minded. Appreciate that. Richard Shriver, welcome. Um, sorry you came so late to the party, but we, with Bill's permission, we've got a recording. I started a few minutes late, so you can listen in. Uh, could you share, 
maybe maybe I missed it. Could you share the, the website um, uh, that uh, the professor is uh, has, or can can you share it with the attendees? Uh, Bill, could you? Yeah, I, it's uh, the the name of the website is legal legal insurrection, and legal it's just insurrection. Le legalinsurrection.com. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Okay. I've got it. I'm putting it into the chat right now. So good. Yeah. There you, okay. there you have it. So yeah. Well, gentlemen, um, thank you again. Um, we'll speak with you in the next month. Um, we've got a few more alumni presentations coming up and uh, and one more speaker before the holidays. So I hope you'll join us and uh, be well and have a good night. Okay, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thanks. Okay. See you. Next. Oops. What am I going to do here? Oh. Yeah. All right. Go. Just leave. Bye bye.